everyone, my name is Sarah Chen, and I am the editor of the newsletter at the Asian Neuropsychological Association, or ANA. As part of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the United States, we bring to you a series of five interviews and conversations with notable scholars and leaders in our field today, uh, which was inspired by similar work uh, from our colleagues at the Society for Black Neuropsychology. Special thanks goes out to Dr. Kendra Anderson for her help and guidance in this project. We'll be uploading a new video every Thursday in the month of May through the first week of June on our YouTube page, which is also where you'll be able to find our other videos. So do check those out. Our association will not be what it is today without the direction and support of those in our community. So as such, we welcome and invite comments, suggestions, and any insights you may have for our guests and our media team. You can bring these to our attention via email at the.ana.newsletter at gmail.com or you can also tweet us at, at Asian Neuropsych. You can also check out our website at the-ana.org. Our second guest today is Dr. Anita Sim, a board-certified clinical neuropsychologist who works at the Minneapolis VA healthcare system. If her name sounds familiar, it's because she was more recently featured in one of our previous issues of the newsletter, so do check that out on the website. Dr. Sim completed her PhD at the University of Nebraska in clinical psychology, her internship at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sim has been a staff neuropsychologist at the Minneapolis VA since 2008, where she trains interns and residents in clinical neuropsychology and rehabilitation psychology. Her clinical and research interests have primarily focused on traumatic brain injury and neurocognition in veterans, multicultural factors in neuropsychology, and symptom and performance validity. Professionally, she has served as a member of the American Academy of Clinical Neuropsychology's Board of Directors, Executive Committee, and she was most recently the inaugural chair of ACN's first diversity committee, the Relevance 2050 Initiative, until her term ended in 2021. She is also an oral examiner for the American Board of Clinical Neuropsychology, and in her free time, she enjoys hobbyist photography and traveling. Speaking to Dr. Sim today is Ms. Ivy Cho. Ms. Cho is one of our own. She is currently a member of the Student Committee and Newsletter Committee here at ANA. You may recognize her name from some of our more recent issues of the newsletter, and you will also continue to see it in the near future as well. She is a second-year Korean-Canadian PhD student at the University of Toronto Scarborough. As part of her graduate program, she is one of the student representatives on the Inclusivity Committee, where she works with program faculty and staff to organize the annual Invited Diversity Speaker Series at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Her doctoral dissertation is focused on dissociating proactive and reactive forms of cognitive control in individuals with depression and healthy older adults. In her free time, she enjoys at-home yoga and baking. Without any further delay, I'm just going to let them take it away. Um, hi, Dr. Sim. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I know that many of us, including myself, are really excited to hear from you um, as part of Asian Heritage Month. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just get started then. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Okay, so um, as many of our viewers or listeners um, may know, you gave an interview for ANA's October newsletter um, in 2020. And during that interview, you really kindly shared your path to becoming a neuropsychologist and your identity as a second generation Korean American as well. Um, so I wanted to start off by building on that question or on that, on that interview and ask how your parents reacted or what they said when you told them that you were going to be a neuropsychologist and how you kind of explain to them what neuropsychology um, is. <laughs> it's a great question because um, I don't think they still understand <laughs> what I do, um, which fits with kind of the way I was raised. Um, I think there was, they always just had an expectation that I would do well academically um, but never really had the time or ability to kind of delve into the, the details of what I was doing in school or what I was studying. And, um, and so they, they understand that I'm a, a brain doctor 
in the PhD realm, yeah, as opposed to uh, the physician uh, or surgical realm, but um, that's probably the extent of their their understanding. I think they're proud, which is nice always, um, but um, the details, yeah, I don't think they can appreciate. Yeah. I was curious about that question because when I was interested in clinical neuropsychology and I was trying to explain to my parents, like, this is what I want to do um, later down the road, they were also just kind of very confused. I don't think, I still don't think they kind of understand the concept of clinical neuropsychology um, to the details um, that probably I understand it to be. So yeah, it's always kind of been challenging to kind of explain what I'm studying, what I'm doing in clinical practicum mm-hmm. as well. So it sounds like it's kind of, not just me, but maybe others can resonate to that question as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of it also do, has to do with just Korean culture, right? Where mm-hmm. to the extent that neuropsychology falls sort of with, under the umbrella of mental health and with all the stigma of mental health care in Korea or in Korean culture, um, even just societally, there's opportunity for them to not fully appreciate, I think, kind of, um, this niche, uh, profession, I think. Yeah, for sure. For sure. My next question, um, a lot of these questions come from me as a student and, um, as you, I'm sure you're working as a supervisor as well. So what are some supervisor traits or characteristics that students of color should look for in a culturally competent supervisor? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I think, of course, um, cultural humility and even comprehension of what that concept or uh, value is. Um, I think that's one of actually one of the biggest challenges in our field where there is a significant um, disconnect, perhaps, between supervisors who are older um, and obviously trained in a generation where we might have had one class on multiculturalism at the most that was divvied up into these very discreet um, knowledge-based topics as if that alone allows us to have uh, multicultural competence. And then we have obviously uh, the younger generation of trainees where, um, you know, I've been thrilled and impressed with the amount of multicultural training my trainees come in with. And Mm -hmm. I wish that's something that I would have gotten in my training. Um, But that that disconnect between just even uh, knowledge base has can create issues. And I know for a lot of trainees that's, uh, or especially trainees of color or from racial or ethnic backgrounds, um, that's a problem in trying to seek good training and competent training at the doctoral internship, postdoctoral level. Um, And so, you know, really trying to um, seek out programs and seek out supervisors who um, A, understand that you have to approach uh, multicultural neuropsychology with humility, Mm -hmm. um, making efforts, concerted efforts to develop any skills or knowledge um, that needs to be kind of brought up to speed (laughs) from years of maybe neglect or not paying attention to those matters. Um, Obviously being within a system. So can't just be the, sometimes a supervisor, right? If you're in a training program or in an institution that um, is not supportive, then that's also going to be, be an issue. Um, that's kind of the dark side, <laughs> but I think the, the great side, which I love about um, organizations such as a and and HNS and SBN is, um, and kind of our virtual world now is that mm-hmm. we can get a lot of training, mentorship, support um, outside of maybe the training program that we're in. I think you touched upon kind of okay. really good points about of supervisor traits or characteristics that students of color should be or should be look should be looking for in a culturally competent supervisor. Yeah. And one thing that's really interesting to me that you highlighted was that 
it's not just kind of the relationship between the supervisor and the student, but also there are other kind of outside factors that are also involved, like whether it's the organization or kind of these larger structural components that are often not kind of in the control of the student themselves. And I think kind of searching these additional resources like ANA um, can be really helpful for students who are still kind of looking for mentors or supervisors um, to help them and guide them. Absolutely, because I think we've all been in a situation where um, we've kind of had a microaggression against us. And that leaves trainees with like, is that, is it just me? Mm -hmm. And if you can't bring that concern to the larger training director or the larger institution and um, feel supported, um, then that's, that's a bad situation, right? Like, um, there's enough gaslighting going on or trainees are already in a position of uh, being lower on a power differential. And so um, I think that's important to. Um, so kind of in line in regards to student training, often it's the case or traditionally it's been the case that students entering a clinical psychology graduate program are often coming from well-educated backgrounds, having access to gaining experiences, whether it's research or clinical opportunities prior to entering graduate school. Um, however, are there options or what are the options for students who may not come from these more traditional backgrounds, including those who might not have access to these types of experiences but are interested in pursuing clinical neuropsychology? Um. I think an important consideration is to not um, feel like there's only one way to become a clinical neuropsychologist or to follow the very strict traditional pathway of even going to a graduate program that has a neuropsychology emphasis, for instance, or a trap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work at a large VA where we have about a hundred psychologists. Um, and one thing I think is remarkable about that is all of us are essentially doing the exact same work um, and have come to the exact same place, but from so many different ways. Like I have literally colleagues who went to Harvard, <laughs> like exceptionally bright um, people. And I also have colleagues who went to programs that I actually, you know, had never even heard of. Um, but yet again, we're all in the exact same place now. And because we're government employees, we're earning the exact same salary. Um, but our values brought us to that same place, right? We all have a, a desire to serve veterans. And um, I think it's important for people to also, or treat people who want to pursue neuropsychology to also think about it in the same way that um, sure you may not go this way to become a neuropsychologist, but um, you can still get there. Um, and uh, in fact, it's one of the things that I know our training program looks for in applicants is we like the applicants who um, may not have had the traditional neuropsychology practicum experiences read right around their grad program, but actually mm -hmm. sought out or created neuropsychology experiences. So they reached out to um, someone in private practice and created their own um, practicum because they really were devoted to neuropsychology and wanted that experience and that kind of go-getting um, motivation and initiative, uh, I think will will shine through, I think, for a lot of um, applicants, even if um, you don't follow one traditional pathway to becoming a neuropsychologist. And it sounds like from what you're saying that people who come in with different backgrounds probably also bring in like a different lens or a different way of thinking that would kind of further um, like add quality or add kind of breath to add breath and depth to that field and the way you're working with patients as well. Absolutely. We, again, that's something that we emphasize in our program is having or looking for applicants who have a unique worldview and have had a certain um, life experience or even untraditional ways of 
becoming um, a PhD student or a PsyD student that, um, yes, it's untraditional and some people may think that's a negative and we actually think that's a positive. It's like, way to, way to, way to get there, you know? Like, um, what about students who aren't in graduate school yet, but are kind of interested in approaching or entering a graduate school program um, for clinical neuropsychology? Um, are there ways that we can maybe kind of diversify that kind of student population and hoping that we do get more diverse students who aren't coming from these more traditional backgrounds at a kind of a younger um, age range or age group? Yeah, I think that's something that um, probably all the um, neuropsychological organizations have discussed and want to do. And I think even ANA and HNS have looked into, um, you know, we, we, we have kind of a pipeline issue, right? Um, and so and I think there's increasing recognition that you can't sort of target the pipeline even at the college level anymore because students are coming in so prepared already. Um, and so we have to move, you know, even beyond that to a high school level. Um, and so a lot of high school programs, you know, do have, psychology, um, or at least in their biology <laughs> courses. Um, and I think that is something that we can all do in terms of our advocacy efforts, you know, is volunteer um, an hour to go talk to your, the high school um, and talk about neuropsychology. Cause I, I think, you know, what else is there that's more fascinating than the brain, right? Mm -hmm. And the brain is <laughs> yeah. a little brain model. Um, you know, I think gets uh, younger students pretty jazzed about, um, yeah, I think something, it's something that we can do as individual um, neuropsychologists, but it's certainly also something that um, I think all the organizations have to, and I think are um, trying to make efforts to uh, address the pipeline and try to reach students younger and younger and younger so that they are prepared to be a competitive doctoral student applicant. Yeah, I was also wondering, because as chair of the relevance committee, um, I'm sure you can maybe speak more about maybe what that committee is doing in terms of approaching students, like kind of earlier on in the pipeline as well. Yeah, I, I, I will say that I rotated off as chair. Um, so oh. Dr. Uh, Tony Stringer um, at Emory is the new uh, chair of relevance, but um, yeah, one of the things I, I'll give a plug um, to um, Octavio Santos and um, his chairmanship of the um, Student Pipeline Committee. And so that's one subcommittee within Relevance whose sole purpose was is to um, address kind of the pipeline issue. Um, and some of the neat things he has done, you know, a few years ago, he went to... Um, a meeting of all the clinical training directors of uh, graduate school programs um, to, to talk about neuropsychology um, and to help try to recruit um, diverse individuals into neuropsychology. Again, because I think once people hear about neuropsychology, they get really excited. The problem we often see, of course, is that people find out about neuropsychology too late, you know, and then the catch up becomes very difficult when you're competing against students who were focused on neuropsychology from right. year one in grad school. Right. Um, and so he and his um, subcommittee with uh, co-chairs now with Jennifer Parazza, um, I think they've just didn't have done fabulous work also utilizing the webinar platform technology, you know, younger folks are now on webinars. It's, free available on YouTube, um, such that, I, you know, I think anybody these days, if you're maybe Googling psychology, brain, neuropsychology, hopefully some of these things will come up to allow um, a much more broader um, reach than maybe we could do on our, on our own. Um, within um, AACN, there's also kind of a board certification promotion committee um, with representatives across the country um, who actually just kind of go out to colleges 
um, and talk about neuropsychology and board certification. And so there are efforts. Um, I think we can probably do a better job as well, but um, those are just some of the initiatives. Yeah, I feel like connection or getting connected with other groups and other individuals is such an important part. And I think because everything's kind of more virtually now as well, we are kind of given more opportunities to connect with other people as well. And also just kind of widens kind of the exposure that we can um, have and the connections that we can make. So I think, yeah, it really highlights kind of the importance of exposure early on and kind of building on those connections to kind of string those um, bonds as well. Yeah, and just not to feel so alone and have yeah. role models, right? Like mm-hmm. I know growing up, I didn't see an Asian woman who was a neuropsychologist and be able to say, oh, I want to be just like her, right? Um, I had other role models, but certainly wasn't someone who looked like me and was in neuropsychology. And so um all of these various, I think, platforms, social media. I know Anna has done a lot of work on Facebook or social media stuff. Um, it just it creates that um, exposure and representation that I think, of course, helps. For sure. The power of rep- representation, I think, is yeah. very important. Great. Um, so I kind of wanted to circle back to a point that you were talking about earlier, and it's that students were often were often kind of in vulnerable positions and even though we might not face kind of more overtly racist comments we can face microaggressions um how can students have effective conversations with people of higher power regarding um, these incidents or microaggressions um that is a very good and tough question because even as someone who's firmly mid-career, I struggle with that. Um, whether that be with people who are um, in a higher position of power than me, whether it be at work or in kind of more of an organizational context. I think one is support um, to know, A, it's not just all in your head. Um, that it's a real thing that happened. Um, I think anytime, I think microaggressions are so tough, right? Because we're often left, um, I, I, I can only use the term gaslighting because I think a lot of times um, there's a tendency to um, make it seem like it was all in our head or that we are overreacting to something, but most of us know when something doesn't quite feel right, right? Uh, we have our lived experience where um, like, no, that there's there was something more to <laughs> that. Um, so the support, um, whether hopefully that's with your peers or within um, more of a virtual space like ANA or with other people we've connected with to just um, feel like you're not alone first. Um, and then like in any, I think, difficult situation, whether it be professional or even just our clinical work, I think consultation of like, oh gosh, you know, this happened. What's the best way for me to, to, to handle, to handle this? Like, should I directly um, address the issue with my supervisor? Um, But yeah, you know, (laughs) That's, yeah, I, I, I'm struggling because honestly, um, like I said, I, I struggle myself with how best to handle situations like that. Um, and I'm I'm mid career. I'm privileged um, in many ways too, and so um, I think I have a lot of empathy for especially trainees, students in doctoral programs. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. For sure. I think it's very, like, as a student, like, validating to hear, like, as you, like, brought up, um, like, it's not just in your head, like, these are experiences that are real that you're experiencing. Um, But I think something that I, that you could really struggle with the students as well is how often do you address these comments? Like, do you just let these comments go every time you hear them? Because you're just like, oh, it's just one comment, like, let it go. Or should you really kind of be 
actively trying to actually point out like, hey, like this is what I'm experiencing right now. Um, can we have a conversation about this? So I don't know, in your experience, have you like how have you tried to find the kind of the balance between what you address versus what you don't address? Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, it also, there's a personality dimension to this too, right? Where for some people, they are most comfortable and most, um, they feel the best about addressing these things directly. Like any topic that's difficult, I think the more you, you practice and you get used to talking oh, about right. it, it becomes easier um, and so one way I can imagine is just having kind of a, a back pocket comment that you can say like, huh, you know, like sort of like the confusion thing, like, what did you, you know, I'm not, I'm having trouble right. understanding what did you mean by that? Um, cause I think what sometimes happens to a lot of us is when we're not prepared in that way with kind of a easily readied response, we're so tongue tied in the moment and we're confused, like, um, did he really just say that? Or um, I know for me, I, I shouldn't speak to everybody. I know for me, um, I have a really difficult time coming up with something or thinking about something on the spot, especially when I'm emotionally affected. Um, and it's only like two hours later when I'm like <laughs> perseverating and yeah. ruminating about the whole thing. That's when I can come up with like, oh, I should have said blah. Um, right. And so sometimes, you know, yes, maybe you didn't address something in the initial or one episode of microaggression, uh, but getting the support and processing it with trusted supervisors or colleagues or friends allows you then to have kind of almost a ready response that you could use the next time it happens. Um, or in certain instances, even just um, being able to use those responses to help help other folks. If you see a microaggression occurring with somebody else mm -hmm. um, and you're just a bystander, um, being able to um, potentially help out a, a friend or colleague. It's always like when you have an argument, like when you are having like an argument with someone and then you're like five hours and you're like, oh, I should have said that. But then I was like so worked up in the moment <laughs> that, I, that I couldn't think of that response um, on the spot. Great. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, in your opinion, what are kind of like the systematic things that have acted as obstacles in creating changes within the field of neuropsychology? So in other words, like what are the structural weak points in the field of neuropsychology as a whole? I think as a specialty um, and discipline, we are, we are very kind of a regimented specialty, right? We follow very strict administration guidelines or scoring guidelines. And I think that rigidity um, kind of overshadows the entire field sometimes that um, has prevented change, you know? Um, I mean, even at the level of um, just tests that we use, like a lot of neuropsychologists don't want to adopt new tests because we like the old ones. Even something as um, benign as trails. And I, and I think a lot of it, has to do with um, just the fields, like I said, rigidity, and um, we're so stuck on doing things in a certain way that um, that's one, um, I think, stuck point. Um, secondly, I think is it can't go acknowledge that we're, the field um, is not diverse. <laughs> um, if you look at Jerry Sweet's um, articles on um, kind of the salary surveys, but also includes demographics, you know, of course, not surprisingly with each generation and year after year, there's more women and there's slight increases in the number of um, uh, fellows and staff who are people of color, but 
for a long time, the field was predominantly men um, who were who were white. Uh, and neuropsychology is not unlike any other system <laughs> um, where the power structures uh, are hard to um, push up against or try to change or um, you know, dismantle, that would be <laughs> um, much more challenging. And so um, has there been change? Yes, slowly but surely. Um, but there are, I think, unique aspects of um, neuropsychology um, as a specialty area and a discipline that have made it particularly uh, more resistant to um, changes and perhaps other other fields. Right, right. I think some like a point that you made about the changes kind of being relatively slow um, brought up a point in my mind where I think like very recently um, there has been a lot of focus towards acknowledging diversity, talking about diversity. Um, but like you said, these changes have been relatively slow and are there ways for us to have more fruitful discussions regarding diversity? So not just kind of talking about it because it's something that we should address and have to address, but really kind of getting more out of those conversations and out of those initiatives. Mm, tell me more. So given this increased focus on diversity, I feel like anytime where there's like a talk or like a workshop, we we talk about diversity because it's important and we have, and it's almost like a hot topic that we should acknowledge and kind of have a conversation about, yes. but sometimes it can feel kind of very almost repetitive in the sense where it's just, we're talking about it, but nothing, not much seems to come out from these conversations yes. or that changes that we kind of see. So are there ways for us to have more kind of fruitful or productive conversations and discussions regarding diversity in that sense. Yes. Um, very important point and um, question. I think um, I have to give a ton of credit to um, AACN past president, um, Karen Postal, where this issue of um, not having diversity be this sort of siloed topic um, has been something that she has uh, been a huge proponent of breaking down that that essentially kind of racist system, right? Like even at conferences, she speaks passionately about the fact that a lot of times you had the one or two diversity talks and then all the other talks were about, you know, regular neuropsychology. Um, and it just it was a sort of siloed um, topic that only the people who like the, the diversity stuff, you know, attended or um, uh, talked about. Um, and I think um, I will speak mostly to AACN because that's where I've been mostly involved in with the relevance committee is um, I think a huge change um, that we have made and we're implementing, implementing to not have it just be this hot topic um, is one, I think for our conferences, um, it's no longer gonna be just the, the couple of diversity talks over here. You know, I think, um, I can't remember if I spoke to Sarah about this in the, um, the ANA um, newsletter, but now one of the learning objectives that every workshop speaker that presents at the ACN conference has to integrate yeah. multicultural issues into their talk. In other words, you can't just talk about um, the trail making test for three hours and just assume that it applies to every other cultural group, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or not talk about diversity issues at all. So, um, so that's one way where it's, um, I think we're going to actively try to, prevent it just being like a hot topic that it, it becomes a regular mm -hmm. and necessary topic that is discussed um, in our annual meetings and any sort of CE offering that we provide. Um, 
And I, I think I want to be optimistic in the sense that I think there's growing um, appreciation and rec- recognition that it, it can't just be um, the hot topic because, you know, depending on where you live and practice, like unless you're comfortable with referring out or turning away every other patient that comes through your door, like you have to start becoming a competent uh, multicultural provider if you want to say that you practice evidence-based or psychology. Um, And so my hope is that, you know, with growing um, appreciation and recognition of that issue, um, that it it truly will be something that um, actually will be maybe a hot topic in a good way, (laughs) that it constantly remains a hot topic because there's a, Mm -hmm. a passion for it and there's a awareness that we need this. Um, knowledge and a thirst. So um. I think that highlights a really important point that I think it's also a social justice issue, but also just from the like the perspective of practicing neuropsychology for this field to kind of be of help to patients and to people who are seeking these services that this has to be something that's continually focused on, continually worked on, and kind of continually studied and like applied within the field for sure. So as students, what are, do you have kind of suggestions about what we can do to overcome more of these obstacles that you've talked about um, regarding the field of neuropsychology, in your opinion? I, one is, you know, I think that um, while acknowledging the, the power differential we've um, talked about is, you know, um, continuing to talk about it, perhaps in a supervisory setting or um, in social media platforms. Like, this is what we need. This is what we want. This is what's necessary for the field of neuropsychology because um, that voice um, is important. Um, and I don't, I don't think that the the issues exist necessarily because supervisors don't want to talk about um, multicultural concerns or become multiculturally competent. It's just, again, almost like that you, you get settled in into this rigidity of like, well, this is what I've always done. And so, you know, um, but I think, I, I like to think that any supervisor who has a trainee that is constantly asking about um, these issues or asking questions like, how would I handle this case? That that would be helpful um, and that would be welcomed. Um, I think most people who supervise genuinely enjoy that that interactive process. I, that's what I love about training is that my students keep me kind of on my toes and ask questions that sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that um, because I want to be sure that I get it right. And, you know, that I'm hitting my, my um, journals again or my books to make sure I'm not missing anything. So um, I think not just in neuropsychology, but, you know, you see this across a number of different um, social justice issues is it's the young individuals or trainees are, are the ones who, speaking loudly, repeatedly. Um, and I think that's important even in our psychology as well. So <clears throat> not just like you were saying from the students, but also hopefully um, our supervisors are receptive to um, kind of our concerns or our questions. And hopefully that kind of provides a platform for further change in the future. Yeah, and I think that's where one important role of the organizations come into play, right? Um, and that may need um, ongoing updates of our credentialing requirements, whether that be maintaining CEUs or even board certification or mm-hmm. other. Sometimes you just got to do it. You got to put <laughs> um, a requirement in, in place. But if you want to maintain your, your license or your board certification or whatnot, that maybe we just need to make certain things a requirement, like. 
So potentially even kind of larger structural changes that might have to happen in the future. Great. Um, so my last question for you is how do you envision um, a a supporting your work? Two ways. Um, one, I think, is just the community, right? Um, especially these days where um, it's just sad, these stories of Asians and Asian Americans being attacked and... Um, so, you know, I think one is just the professional and collegial support of a community of like-minded um, professionals or even students um, who where you know, we can provide support to one another, um, not just as neuropsychologists, but as um, individuals um, during a dark time. Um, so that's one way I see a and um, supporting. And then secondly, of course, is the actual academic or uh, resource side, right? Um, is a and has, I think, fabulous um, groups and individuals working, you know, across, I think, all um, the different sort of ethnic groups, whether it's... Koreans or Filipinos or Chinese. And, you know, it's just an amazing, I think, resource to quickly be able to tap into expertise. Um, uh, and so I think on the academic and resource end is how I see ANA helping. Um, yeah. I, I remember being really kind of excited when I first found out about ANA, just having the idea of kind of like a central hub where it's providing this support and also these resources that I might just not be aware about as a student. So I think you touched upon kind of a really important point where having this central hub where people can gather, people can share resources freely um, and openly um, is very valuable in the sense where um, just, yeah, it's just nice to have this central hub that um, I just wasn't aware about before. Yeah. Um, so. Thank you so much for speaking um, and uh, yeah, speaking with me today and connecting with us. Um, I really kind of appreciated um, your insight and also like your authenticity about sharing and speaking about your experiences um, with us. So thank you. Thank you. It was nice talking to you.